At the recent Velo City International Congress in Adelaide, it was really exciting for me to catch up with Anna Mears. She's a Motor Accident Commission Road Safety Ambassador. And of course, we got to chat about world championships, Olympic medals and more. The delegates were really keen to hear her story. Anna, we might start with uh, the cycling the, uh, and right up to what you're up to uh, literally this week. But let's go back to um, some gold medals. When was the BMX medal? <laughs> did BMX, I started when I was about five, uh, racing in age groups much older than I was because I, where I grew up um, there weren't too many girls competing in the BMX side so um, my, yeah, probably five years of age and that was when the competitive sport involvement started for me even though I kind of just tagged along with my older brothers and sisters and riding a bike was fun. Um, I grew up in the country, it was generally the only way for us to get around as kids other than walking or running and honestly riding a bike was fun. So I got to where I wanted to go much, much quicker. And tell us a bit more about where you were at the time. I grew up in a small coal mining town in central Queensland called Middlemount in the Bowen Basin. Uh, it was a population of 2,000 people, so we never really had any trouble with traffic. We didn't have a stop sign, a traffic light. We had one new way sign. Um, if you wanted to pass a driver's license, you had to perform a parallel parking, and we had a little hill that you had to kind of do a bit of a hill start on. So that's generally what life was like for us. Um, but if you ventured outside the town, that was when it got pretty dangerous because we had obviously the the coal trains and the coal trucks going through, delivering um, from from the mines to the ports uh, towards Rocky and Gladstone. So um, always did laps of the town, which was only seven k. I got really bored. Um, so my sister and I, we often made fun, um, knocking each other off and creating little jumps and stuff. BMX kind of crossed over into the cycling. And in fact, uh, Kerry, of course, becomes an important part of the saga of cycling, and, a, and a, a difficult one for you at times. Just take us through those early days when, right up to being chosen for the Olympics, it's you or it's Kerry. really short, really skinny when I started cycling and I was told I'd be a good road rider but it just didn't interest me. I didn't have the attention span. I didn't like riding up hills. It was all about the track. It was all about trying to go fast. It was all about comp close competition with other riders. Whereas Kerry physically was very different. She was very strong. She was much bigger than I was. I kind of had mum's build and Kerry kind of had dad's build. Um, so she was naturally very, very talented as a sprint cyclist on the track and that's obviously where her attention and interest was as well. So the, the competition was constant between us from, from when we were born to when we got into cycling. Um, but you know, it, it took me five or six years to find my feet and actually become competitive. And in that time, Kerry became quite a prodigy athlete. She was selected into the QAS, brought down to Adelaide here for the Australian Institute of Sport. She was earmarked for Sydney to be one of the youngest ever um, representatives for track cycling. Um, she was ch just shy of selection in that um, era. And then in 2004, which was the next um, Olympics we were both eligible for, uh, she got injured a year out from competition um, and no longer was in contention. So, you know, sometimes I think, you know, did I get the opportunity because she was injured, but still I had to earn those qualifying points to get to the Olympic Games and unfortunately there was only one spot. Uh, the Athens Games and the build-up to the time trial, um, just, just take us through you and the coach and even your dad in his role in getting you to that just phenomenal world record at the age of... I was 20, so my first Olympics. I'd only just moved to Adelaide the year before, um, so that was big, and being 19 and leaving home, coming to a big city like Adelaide from country Queensland. Um, you know, I became world champion that year, and being world champion meant in the time trial I had to start last, so I had to watch every international competitor, world champions, previous Olympic champions, previous world record holders, previous, ride their race, and then I had to be, be the penultimate rider. Um, so I actually did two months of psychological preparation for that because how do you prepare for something so grand and so big at the Olympics when you've never been there, you don't know what to expect, and you still need to perform under pressure of being that last starter. 
So we went through um, imagery and I closed my eyes and I was out at the track here at Jeps Cross and the psychologist and my coach was running me through what I thought the Olympic Games was going to be like, imagining the crowd, imagining the colour, the flags, the noise, the cameras, the nervousness, the adrenaline, you know, could I swallow, you know, that sort of stuff. What did I think that that environment was going to be like? And then I opened my eyes and I tried to do a training effort and I performed in the worst possible way that I had since coming to Adelaide. Over about a half a lap, I was half a second um, slower, purely off of what I thought the Olympic environment was going to be like. The velodrome was empty. It was just me, my coach and the psychologist. And I absolutely psyched myself out of it, off of what my mind was telling me what to expect. So we ran through those drills every day for two months to prepare for the environment of the Olympics. I got there and every day for two months my coach said to me 34-1 to beat because that's what he believed it was going to take to win the Olympics that year. And would you believe the last thing my coach said to me when the world record holder Zhang from China had finished her race, because I wasn't looking at the clock, I was just looking at the coach, and he said last ride of the Olympics 34-1 to beat. That was the time that she rode. Um, that time was a personal best by two seconds for me, so I significantly had to lift if I was going to be in contention for medals. Um, and before I left, my dad actually gave me a little present, and he wrote 33.999 on it, which was would have been the world record, and I kind of just threw up my bag, I'm like, yeah, whatever, Dad. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Never going to get to open that present. Never going to get those diamond earrings that are in there. <laughs> they weren't diamond earrings. But it um, turned out I actually went and wrote it when I performed a 33.952. I broke the world record, I broke the Olympic record, got my present, which was a nice little cloth that my dad had uh, embroidered for me to remember. No matter what heights I reach in my career and, and where I travel in the world, I should always remember where I come from and the people who have helped me get there.